Welcome to the Holy Land and this biblical site here. This is the believed place where Christ gave the Great Commission. He said to come to the mountain. As you look all around the sea here, this would be the natural place. He's not gonna do it on the east side. This would be the best place, overlooking where he spent 60 to 70% of his ministry time on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee. So this is amazing to be here in the very footsteps of Jesus and his disciples to experience and be in the same place where Christ gave the Great Commission to go into all the world and preach the gospel. We will see the same sights that Jesus and his disciples saw as Christ spoke some of his last words to them. The view from here is breathtaking and we'll be showing you all about it and reliving the Great Commission command of Jesus to all of us. This is going to be really special and moving and I'm excited to share this place with you. We'll begin by orienting ourselves and seeing all the major sites around the Sea of Galilee where Jesus walked, taught, performed, and done a ton of miracles and ministered. And then we'll relive Christ's words to us of the Great Commission. Now Mount Arbel is located on the west side of the Sea of Galilee and is the tallest mountain around the sea. From the park entrance, it's a little hike up to the best viewing places, but well worth it. For others who might be coming to visit this site, the climb is gradual so just about anyone can walk it. Along the way, there are many breathtaking views to see, so it's really special to experience this. It has a spectacular view of the Sea of Galilee, which is about eight miles or 12 kilometers wide and about 13 miles or 21 kilometers long. It rises about 1,200 feet or 365 meters above the Sea of Galilee. It has on its eastern side a cliff that drops right down to the Sea of Galilee Basin. This cliff has many natural caves that have been used throughout history for battles and protection purposes. Now history and tradition locate Mount Arbel as the place where Christ gave the Great Commission mandate to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Many theologians believe this is the place because it is the tallest mountain in the area and provides a perfect view of the Sea of Galilee. Because Christ spent around 60 to 70 percent of his ministry time around the Sea of Galilee, Mount Arbel would have provided the perfect backdrop as Christ gave the powerful Great Commission mandate to his disciples. So now let's look at all of the sites around the Sea of Galilee. So, where's Magdala? Okay, Magdala right there. You see all the ruins we went through? You see where we walked down to the beach? You see over to the right, there's another square that's been excavated a little bit? I was going to ask you what that was. That's all part of Magdala. In fact, over into the pasture would be Magdala. It's a pretty good sized community. Up on this side of the road would be Magdala. Okay, so it's a pretty good sized community. It was about one to 2,000 as we talked about. And then it had the port. So then as we walk up the lake, then what's the next thing we see? Okay, we're gonna see Guinnessor, right? Or Gennesaret. See the boat dock there? See the boat dock going out into the water? That's Gennesaret. Okay, so when Jesus comes from the feeding of the 5,000, once again, that's where he arrives. Okay, so after a Gennesaret, we're gonna walk up the shore. Do you see where we thought the calling of the disciples were? You walk up the shore, see that kind of little inlet there? And then past the inlet, you see the kind of the white stuff along the beach there? That's where we sat and we did the calling of the disciples. Can you see it? And then just past that, it kind of goes in and then you see it kind of starting going to the right. You see the white building right in the curve? That's Tabga. Okay, that's the official place of the restoration of Peter. Right up above that, you see the plastic, the banana trees, 
And then right above that is the Mount of Beatitudes. We'll walk down the Mount of Beatitudes to see the in between the plastic. That's the trail we walked down as we came down from the Mount of Beatitudes. Okay, so then we come back down to the lake. We're gonna walk around it, keep going, see where it kind of does a cove going in, kind of a big cove. And then it kind of comes out, see the white building? That's Capernaum. See it? Hey, okay, that's Capernaum. All right. Then we kind of walk and you can kind of see it kind of goes in again. Then we kind of keep walking around. That's the inlet to the Jordan River and that's Bethsaida. Okay, then from Bethsaida, we're gonna walk to the right. And then do you see where it kind of gets dark there on the shoreline? Okay, so just to the left of that a little bit is the feeding of the 5,000. Then right above that where it's the dark green, that is the mountain that Jesus would have went upon to pray. Then you see where the white dot is? We went up that draw and then went over on that hillside. And that's where we did the Bethsaida lookout or the Sea of Galilee lookout. So go back down to the white dot. We're gonna go right. And then you see the plastic, kind of the white. And then you see the draw there. That's the feeding of the 4,000. And then just beyond the feeding of the 4,000 is Kersey. That is where the demon-possessed men, the demons were cast out of. And then if you just go to the right a bit, that's where the pigs ran down the hill. Then just south of where the pigs ran down the hill into the sea and up the hill is Horvat Susita. This was a Decapolis city of the Romans and from where many of the people would have likely came from to see and hear about Jesus casting out the demons into the pigs. It's also likely a reference Jesus referred to when he spoke about letting your light shine like a city on a hill. So now let's see where Christ walked on the water and calmed the storm and sea after feeding the 5,000. Can you spot again where Jesus fed the 5,000? Okay, now look down below us a bit and locate Gennesor or Gennesaret. Right out in the middle of the sea is where Christ walked on the water and calmed the storm and sea. Isn't this all amazing? Again, you can see why Christ would have brought his disciples up to this place. From here, they could remember all the miracles Jesus performed and what they did with their master. It was a time of contemplation, remembering, and meditation on all the experience with Jesus over the three and a half years he spent with them. So I'm gonna to read to you this account of the Great Commission. So in Matthew 28, 16 through 20, it says, Now the 11 disciples went to Galilee. Why 11? Judas had betrayed him. To Galilee to what? to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So what does the phrase, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, what does it mean? All authority, not 95%, not 99% like we've talked about, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore, based upon the authority that I have, all authority, I am God in the flesh, all authority, go and make disciples, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So in the disciple making process and discipleship making involves evangelism, I am with you. In Colossians 1:15 through 17, we see this regarding all authority. 
He, being Christ, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. And the Greek word for firstborn is prototikto, which would give us the meaning of preeminence. He is over all, not firstborn as created. Okay, so he is over all. He is preeminent over all. That's what the phrase here means by firstborn. And it says, for by him, being Christ, all things were created in heaven and on earth. All things in heaven and on earth. Jesus Christ is the creator. For by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, reflecting up to preeminence, and in him all things hold together. So, Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. That's why he could say, all authority in heaven has been given unto me. Therefore, go and make disciples. Now, during Christ's ministry on earth, he performed every class of miracle to show he was Lord over every aspect of creation. He was Lord over sickness, he healed. He was Lord over the demons. He cast out demons, he cast out the legion into the pigs. He was Lord over the weather. He calmed the sea and walked on the water. He was Lord over nature. He cursed a fig tree and it died. He was Lord over the animals. Christ cast out the demons on the other side of the lake. He was Lord over food. He fed 5,000 and 4,000. He was Lord and had the capacity or the ability and the right to forgive sins. And only God has the authority to forgive sins. And he was also Lord over death. He not only healed people, but then he rose from the dead as well. It says in Philippians 2, 9, you guys know this verse, that every knee in heaven and on earth will bow to him and confess that he is Lord. So it says, therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed upon him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. So every tongue, every person will one day confess Jesus Christ as Lord. We'll either do it in a worshipful manner or we'll do it in a manner in which we finally realize and have to confess that. So based upon the authority that Christ possesses, he commands us to go and make disciples. It says in Matthew 28, 19 and 20, Go therefore and make disciples. The therefore is referring to the fact that in him all power and authority reside. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you to the end of the age. So once again, in the disciple making process, Christ is with us. We are not alone in this endeavor. He is with us. So, what are some faith lessons that we can learn from this? Well, all authority in heaven has been given to Christ. Do we truly believe this? Do we truly believe that Jesus Christ is Lord? By, through him, all things were created. The problem that we have is when Christ inhabited a body, became incarnate, and we see Christ praying to the Father, it seems like now we have separate gods, but we don't. Jesus said repeatedly, I and the Father are one. We're not two, we're one. If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. So Jesus was God in the flesh. Once again, Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. For unto us a son is given, a child is born, and the government will rest upon his shoulder. He shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Everlasting Father, and the governments of His shoulders shall be upon Him, and of His kingdom there will be no end. So we sometimes have a problem in Christ's humanity, but He chose to indwell a person, and dwell and become flesh, so He could experience and then be the sacrifice for our sins. So, do we believe that Jesus Christ is fully God? Also, we are called to be missionaries. We are to go and share the gospel. It's up to us to go. 
It's up to us to go to where the unreached are and share Christ with them. Now, we're all called to be missionaries. It says in Acts 1.8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Does anyone know what missionary means? It means one sent. Okay, a missionary is just one who's sent to share the gospel. Most missionary work will take place in your local environment because most of us don't go to a foreign country. Some do, but most the missionary work you will do will be within your own community. Now, just because we're not foreign missionaries doesn't mean we're not missionaries. Okay, we're all sent ones because some would be missionaries sent to Jerusalem, to Samaria, to the othermost parts of the earth, Judea. So we're all called to be missionaries. We all, though, can be helpful in the missionary process. For those that are overseas, we can pray for them, we can support them, we can help them financially. There's many things that we can do even in that aspect. We can help them when they get back. So in summary, we're all to be missionaries. We all share in our local community. For those who are out in the field, as we call it, away from home, then we can help them by praying for them, supporting them financially, maybe when they come back, helping them as well. In fulfilling the Great Commission, it's not just enough to be a good person and hope that our life will preach for us. Now, we obviously want to have a good testimony, but there's a belief out there, and if I can just kind of address it a little bit without being offensive, there's kind of the belief, well, I'm just going to let my light shine, so to speak, and then maybe people will ask me and stuff. Hopefully people will ask me, I'm not going to really say too much, I don't really want to offend anybody. Well, we're all great lights and we all need to have good testimonies, but who had the perfect light? Who was the perfect light? Christ. Did he say anything? What does it say in John 1, 1? He was what? The Word. He was the Word. So, yes, we need to have good testimonies, but we need to speak. Sharing the gospel involves more than just having a good light. If you don't have words with your light, then a person is not going to come to Christ. The next faith lesson is, while I don't believe that baptism saves us, it is still an important aspect because it says here to baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Once again, we know that the thief on the cross, he didn't get baptized, but it's very important. In fact, in the New Testament, baptism was like today when a person walks the aisle, okay? It was right after they got saved, they got baptized. The, the Ethiopian eunuch hears and he says, hey, what prevents me from getting baptized? You see the Philippian jailer hears, gets saved, bang, gets baptized, he and his family. Okay, so it's important to get baptized. Baptism is a declaration to the world that I'm a follower of Christ. I have been buried. My old nature has been buried. It's died. I'm rising again to a new life, Romans 6, 1, okay? So if you haven't been baptized, you should get baptized. And if you haven't, we're going to have an opportunity tomorrow for you to do that in the Jordan River where Jesus got baptized, okay? And of course, for those of you that just want to get baptized, then you can do that just for the experience of being baptized in the Jordan River where Jesus was. You can do that. And then also we are to teach others to obey all Christ had commanded. So we should know God's word. Not only do we share Christ to evangelize, but then we, we're talking about the discipleship process. So we want to know God's word so that we can disciple. And then as we mentioned, do we really realize that Christ is with us in this discipleship making process? Sometimes we feel like it's just us, but trust me, God wants to reach people. We heard Ashraf's testimony. I mean, God wants to reach people. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to the knowledge of the truth. So are we sharing this and are we preaching the Great Commission? And do we realize that we're not alone in the process? We have in us, as we share the gospel, all of the power, because Jesus resides in us, we have all of the power in heaven and earth with us, helping us. Okay, so we are more than, more than adequate. But it is up to us to know God's word and to know the gospel so that we can share it effectively. Okay, and the gospel really begins as you analyze the gospel in Romans, the gospel has two parts. 
It has bad news and it has good news. The bad news is that a person without Christ, if they continue in that state until death, then scripture, I believe, teaches that they're gonna to go to eternal damnation. That's the bad news. If you don't share the bad news, you have no good news. So to the degree you neglect the bad news will be to the degree that the good news loses its power. I believe today one of the reasons why we have so many Christians coming and going through church doors is because a gospel has been preached to them. God loves you. God's going to help you with everything. And so they get on board wanting all of the good, so to speak. They don't want the whole package. They don't want the discipleship. They don't want any suffering. They don't want to serve. They just want to get their life better and add Christ on. And then when he doesn't fulfill what they think and they see the whole package, they bail. What are we doing? We're starting halfway through the gospel. We're preaching the good news and we neglect the bad news. So you can't neglect the bad news. It's uncomfortable today. No one wants to talk about hell. When's the last time you've heard a sermon on hell? I bet it's been a long time. When's the last time you've heard a sermon on the love of God? Every other sermon. I'm sorry, but biblically, where did Christ begin? Repent, repent. Where did John the Baptist begin? repent. So if we leave out, then we don't have much power. And also, uh, there's some who would claim that hell is not eternal. I would wish it's not eternal. My humanity, it sounds really harsh, but I would say this in Matthew 25, after Christ comes and he separates the sheep from the goats, he says that the goats will go into eternal damnation and the sheep into eternal life. Same word is used for eternal damnation as eternal life. I know it's not comfortable, but I think that biblically that the reality of hell is, is there. Uh, Christ referred to it uh, repeatedly. So we need to be sharing the gospel in its entirety. So what a wonderful place. We saw the rain go by. We've looked all around the Sea of Galilee here. And this, once again, I believe this is the best possibility for the giving of the Great Commission. Because he says, go up onto the mountain. Jesus went up on mountains all the time, and he would go up on the mountains to pray. I believe the disciples and Jesus came up here on a regular basis. What a great teaching place. Once again, we've talked about whenever we sometimes want to get close to God, or we're having problems, or we just kind of want to sort things out or whatever, we go up onto mountains. Moses went up onto a mountain to die. Look at all the land and then he died. We have Mount Sinai. We have the Mount of Transfiguration. We have the Sermon on the Mount. We have the mountain where the Great Commission was given. So as you analyze the lay of the land, once again, you're really reduced to just a few options, okay? I don't believe it's gonna be over Tiberias. That's not the place it's gonna be. It's gonna be over the place where they ministered that's where it's going to be. It's not going to be on that side. It's going to be on this side here to the mountain because over there there's some mountains but they're way high up and a lot of them then are in the Decapolis area. So this just seems to be the mountain. It's the highest mountain around the area here. So it just seems to be the best place. So if I was a betting person, which I'm not, I would suggest that we are just right in the area. Like I said, we could be up there just a little bit but I think that this is probably, this terrain here hasn't changed in 2,000 years. It's the same rocks that were here. So I bet this is probably right in the spot, overlooking where they ministered for, for three and a half years. So after Christ rose from the dead, then he would meet them periodically. He would meet them first in Jerusalem. Okay, he would meet with them. The doubting Thomas meets up. Then he sends them to the mountain here in Galilee, go to Galilee. Okay, and the different Gospels kind of start at different points. Matthew kind of starts here, but the other Gospels you have Christ appearing first in Jerusalem. Then he sends him up here. Then he meets him up here. He restores Peter by the sea. We know that's by the sea. We know that the giving of the Great Commission is on a mountain. So he appears to them in different places, but for shorter periods of time. And then they will go back to Jerusalem. They will go up on top of the Mount of Olives 
then that's where he will ascend back to heaven and say goodbye to them. So where we're at right now would be during the 40 days from after he rose from the dead to when he ascended back to heaven. So these accounts are his last, I guess you might say, encouragements to them. But he says, it's better that I go so that the Holy Spirit can come to you and uh, be with you. And of course, he was the Holy Spirit as well. So he was with them. He says, I will be with you always to the end of the age. Well, how special to be here. Thank you for watching and, and may God richly bless you guys.